Alright everyone, today we're talking about running focus groups in sensory analysis and focus groups I enjoy teaching early on in the semester because in some respects it is one of the most straightforward techniques to teach from a sensory perspective. It is a qualitative method and so we don't need as much math to be able to succeed at it but at the same time really running an effective focus group is an art form and there are entire courses and programs in learning how to run focus groups. For example, many organizations want their uh, focus group facilitators or uh, consumer uh, research specialists to have Riva training. There are other private organizations that specialize in running um, train the trainer for focus group facilitation. We're scratching the surface. Focus groups can be one of the most accessible means of doing sensory analysis or consumer um, analytics. At the same time, it can be one of the hardest. So let's jump in and do some. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to define the role of focus groups within product development processes. You'll describe what's required for a big basic focus group sensory setup, including a setup, labeling, and script. We'll identify alternative ways of delivering a focus group via distance. COVID's uh, sure making this into an interesting scenario, and, and there's lots of feasible ways of doing this. And we'll determine an appropriate data collection method and interpret focus group findings using thematic analysis. So let's jump in here. So this is one kind of sensory analysis, and it's, as we see, it is focus groups. It just happens that all my slideshow for this section of the sensory analysis course follow the same format. There are lots of types of sensory analysis. Focus groups are fantastic because they're conversational and they're really meant to elicit behaviors, beliefs, motivations, experiences, feelings, all of the stuff that you really can't quantify in numbers. And so what's great about focus groups is oftentimes they're used early on within product development or ideation teams because you can bring in some potential customers and talk to them about their feelings or ideas. And before you go and invest heavily in a concept, you can make sure that you've got the right direction on that concept, that you're not off on it on the wrong track, making up something that is absolutely ridiculous. Um, in other cases, focus groups are used later in the product development cycle when you're in that process of doing refinement on a concept. And in other cases, uh, it's part of the continuous pro er, continuous improvement process where you've launched a product, it's uh, plateauing in sales, you want to understand people's behaviors or beliefs or how they're using this product, bring them in and host a focus group and understand from a qualitative perspective what's going on. Now, as I'm talking about these uh, different styles of sensory, I do want to phrase it as such. What is the hypothesis that you are testing? Well, in the case of a focus group, it's sort of open-ended. You do want to have an actionable goal, but it's not clear-cut like it is within most of the quantitative methods of sensory analysis. It's, it's really up to you to set some key types of questions and plan where those questions are going to guide the conversation. But at the same time, because focus groups tend to be semi-structured and you can open up the conversation if you feel that there's a unique direction it needs to go, then the hypothesis isn't as clear cut. There are some, I, I've, I've been in focus group sessions that I've facilitated where you think you go in with one clear outcome and you have a completely different outcome when you leave. So one of the key features of focus groups is that oftentimes when you've completed a first round of focus groups, you will identify additional types of study. And quite often those are quantitative uh, studies that you're going to do to follow up. When we were doing our mini focus group on Halloween candy in class, we identified some additional um, quantitative 
research methods that we may want to follow up with. For example, we had conversation about transitioning the packaging material. And so you, perhaps you would be doing a difference test. If you had compostable versus non-compostable packaging material, would people identify a difference in the quality of the product? Perhaps they'd know the difference on the packaging, but if you unwrap that product and put it in front of them, would they know a quality difference in the flavor or sensory attributes? We had another one about intent to purchase. And if you were doing some sort of hedonic test um, and uh, phrased an intent to purchase question, you could bracket it out and see, would people be willing to pay this price for this product or that price? Um, oftentimes, after you've done that focus group, you have additional studies that you'd want to do. And most often, they're quantitative follow-up. That said, there's no set rule. You can't, uh, you oftentimes will do an initial focus group, but then you might find you need to do a second focus group because you had inspiration for new questions within a new scripting uh, modality. So why would a, fo a food scientist care? Well, it's useful at the discovery and ideation phase, and you can look for those key insights and hidden opportunities. Having a conversation about a product might reveal to you how people are um, experiencing and using that product in ways that you do not expect. And it helps frame that marketing narrative for the product based off of people's real experiences and real, uh, real uh, experience with that product. And so often we've had this debate in class where people say, well, my organization doesn't do sensory analysis. We just trust the opinion of the owner of the company and the R&D team, well, oftentimes there's cognitive bias. I believe we talked about cognitive bias, that aspect that your personal opinion and your own ideas are always the best ideas, but um, that's a bias. And so it's it, you often pat yourself on the back thinking that you are the smartest and you are the best when um, oftentimes you need an objective viewpoint to get out of that cognitive bias and say, wait a second, there's lots of things that can be improved here. So focus groups are able to elicit those facts, or not those feelings and opinions, and it can be uh, extremely telling within focus groups. You can pick up on, on sometimes within a focus group nuances about how people are feeling about that product at a, a it's important to select the right people when, when doing the recruitment for this too, to make sure that they don't have, come in with cognitive biases as well. So let's get set up for a focus group. Normally you would be setting up for a small group. Oftentimes you could do semi-structured interviews with one or two people, but usually in a focus group, you'll have uh, somewhere in the range of four to eight participants. And if you need a larger data set, you'll often do repeated uh, small groups. You can do one-on-one -on -one interviews, and that's acceptable too. Um, but the main thing is you want to make sure it's not too, pardon me, not too large. You need to have enough um, opportunity to let people speak freely about their experiences. And you get too many people in that focus group, and uh, people have to cut their answers too short. Now, another thing is you want to screen your participants depending on the scenario that you're after. So... Um, you might be wanting to get people with a specific lived experience. Maybe if we were talking about Halloween candy. Maybe you want parents with children who are um, either preteens or younger. Or maybe you want older teenagers who were recently children. There are ethical considerations that you have to work with when working with, with minors uh, for sensory and qualitative um, research, but sometimes you want specific age groups. Maybe you want people who do not like chocolate and you want to find out why they don't like chocolate if you are in the process of developing a Halloween candy mix box and uh, perhaps one that specializes in chocolate. You might be wanting to understand who are your non-consumers and identify what their um, opinions and beliefs are so that you can tap into them as a potential un, uh, unsourced market such that you want to capture their business. Um, sometimes you're after age or gender bracketing. Um, as long as you're clear and transparent about what you're doing, um, 
it's quite it's quite common to do some sort of segregation of who is participating in your focus group. Other times when you're doing focus groups, you will be targeting key opinion leaders. And this can be uh, like organizational leaders or influencers or executives, people who have a very robust lived experience when um, participating in that focus group. I was recently in a focus group with a, a number of food science uh, leaders and executives, and it was fascinating because most of us knew each other, <laughs> but we were talking about some concepts about how to better serve the food science community. And it was really quite fascinating. We were we, uh, food science leaders from across the country, all on a conference call with uh, webcams. And because we had not only um, executive uh, and leadership level experiences, but we were able to speak not only about our own experience, but the experience of the organizations that we work within. And sometimes that allows for quick seg or quick aggregation of opinion. I think of a focus group that I facilitated a couple of years back where we were designing a beverage and we could have done focus groups with the general public, but we found that um, if we wanted to really hone in on uh, key influencers, we brought in sommeliers and uh, beverage managers from different companies. And so we were quickly able to identify these are experts who know beverages inside and out, and they were um, really enthusiastic about participating. We had some uh, uh, of the beverage instructors from Niagara College in there, and they understand beverages inside and out, and were able to help us hone in on attributes in that beverage that made it desirable. So think, think strategically about who you're recruiting for these. We, we've already had discussion about how you recruit. Now, normally in a focus group, you're going to either set up a round, conference, or round table style conference room, or sometimes you'll set up a conversational seating setup where um, you drop that table barrier. But if you have samples of product, you may want to have the table there so that you can hand out and easily manage the, the different products that you're working with. Just think about the attitude and the tone that you want to set when, when, think, uh, when thinking about the physical layout. But usually it's going to be in a round or uh, semi-rectangular setup so that people are facing each other and are able to talk directly in a, in a clear conversational tone. Sometimes I have seen uh, semi-structured interviews going on in um, a situational environment. So for example, I have seen... Uh, focus group type questions being asked of people as they were doing a task in a kitchen. And a good example of this is um, at, at Maple Leaf Think Food, which is their R&D center. They have a small home style kitchen where they can bring in people to interact with that product. And you could have someone in there um, actually interviewing and probing as, as they make a product. Maybe they're asked to make bacon. You could have someone in there saying, explain to me what you're doing right now. And, and then the person could say, well, I'm in the process of taking the bacon out of the package and, and wrapping it around a pickle or what. <laughs> I'm just throwing out random ideas here, but people can uh, probe deeper into why are you doing this? Explain to me, what is your thought process? Uh, what, where did you get this idea? And tell me about, tell me about what, uh, what your expectations are about this. Um, often, so it, it's less common, but that situational environment can help frame a focus group or a semi-structured interview when done, when done right. Now what we're also seeing is more and more use of sample boxes. And um, we, we took a look at Marie Chevrier Schwartz's uh, company Sampler. Um, more and more, because of COVID and the costs of doing focus groups, by the time you recruit and compensate someone for their participation in a focus group, in many cases, it's, 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 it's as cost competitive, not cheaper, to instead send out a sample box of a product to someone in their home and then follow up with an online interview. And the technology to do that is... Uh, becoming far more accessible and people have overcome that inflection point of saying, well, I can't do an online interview. Now every, everyone is doing online 
calls and online conversations with people. And that uh, uh, it reduces transportation costs, it reduces space costs. You don't have to have a special focus group room or a uh, conference room, or in some cases I've seen uh, organizations book hotels if they're trying to do something uh, covertly. You are going to have different cost structure altogether, but there are ways of doing it by instead sending out a sample and allowing people to experiencing it in their own context and then following up with an interview. Now, it is important before you go into a focus group to build out some strategy. You do want to build out a script and know that you have a plan in place. So first off, you're going to have a quality introduction so that you're not overwhelming people and you're not lecturing them for half an hour before they get started, but you want to concisely say why you're there, reveal enough information so that people can know what they're participating in and understand the risks and benefits and any other um, non-disclosure um, aspects. You want to make sure from a risk benefit perspective, you've covered off any allergens or other health risks that uh, may be occurring from participating, especially if there's an eating component. You want to, in that introduction, give people a, a, a warm sense of uh, their opinions are all valid and fair and that you want people to participate and speak freely and that their ideas are contributing to your research and are valuable. And make sure that people are in that space of trusting that their information is going to be kept um, confidential and and fair. So you've got a quality introduction, then you want to know within your script and the, and the structure of the questions that you are getting to the data points that you know you need to find. Now, inevitably in a focus group or semi-structured interview, you can often find and reveal things that you didn't expect. But usually you go in saying, okay, we have some outcomes here today. Perhaps in that Halloween candy, we wanted to understand um, how do we transition that from being a product that just parents buy for kids and parents buy for eating themselves to um, how do we transition it to other spaces? How do we take that Halloween candy from being a Halloween thing to a year round thing? How can we turn it into uh, something that aligns itself to other life events and other life activities? Perhaps, uh, so you, you want to know what your key data points are. Another project that we may be doing um, in the next round of focus groups, we have a beverage product that we're working on for one of our work integrated uh, learning projects. And we went out and bought every single competitor's beverage and we'll pour it and we'll host a more of a tasting um, style focus group where we identify what are the taste attributes that are desirable, what are the taste attributes that are negative, and what are the, the taste attributes that we feel uh, could be enhanced and amplified within this type of product, and which taste attributes do we want to eliminate to um, have a continuous uh, a quality product. So we'll have a strategy in mind when we go into that session. So we'll build that script around the action items that we want to define, but at the same time, we want to be prepared that we could be going off on a tangent and following that tangent appropriately and shutting it down if it goes way out of uh, the range that we need to be working in. Another thing that when we're building a focus group is that you want to have some strategies in mind before you get in there to be able to politely shut down people because inevitably you'll have someone who rambles and someone who's bossy and someone who dominates the conversation and you need to find strategic ways of saying, all right, we appreciate your opinion. Let's jump to this person over here and find out how they're feeling about this product. Build in and practice some of those strategies before you go in as a facilitator so that you are prepared and you do not become flustered. Now, again, uh, we've, we've said this a hundred times, focus groups are all about capturing people's lived experience and they're conversational and you do have those opportunities to become semi-structured. So as you phrase that question, uh, how do you feel about peanut butter cookies? People will then speak freely about their own opinions and viewpoints. And they'll say, I like peanut butter cookies. They remind me of 
my favorite childhood snacks, and so on. Then you want to, if you feel that you have additional information that you want to get from there, you can use probing. You can use silence. And as a facilitator, it's often tempting when you've got silence to just start rambling on. It's important sometimes to just step back and be, be quiet and create the space for other people to jump in. In other cases, you may use probing questions and it's worth writing some of the uh, probing styles that work for you down on a cue card or um, build them into the script in a, in a master script that you can see so that you can remind yourself and use them frequently. Why do you feel this way? Can you explain that for me? Describe what you are feeling right now. Describe what you were feeling when you experienced that with that product. Um, explain this for me. Um, there's lots of different ways of doing that. Why is the classic? Why do you feel that way? You want to do it in a, in a really warm and encouraging way that continues that conversation. If you use why too much in, 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 a, in, a, in a forceful way, why can sound a little bit like you're in a courtroom. You want to use probing in a gentle and encouraging way so that people feel such that they can continue talking. Oh, we talked about um, that box of Halloween candy that I brought in. And I brought it in and said, well, we're talking about Halloween candy. But one of the key questions I asked was, Explain to me your context with this candy. Are there other ways that you have seen this candy be used? And one of the examples was its parent tax and the, the coffee crisps in particular, that uh, oftentimes parents would take their kids out for Halloween and they would come back and say, well, all the coffee crisps are mine. Thank you very much. So when you see a box like this and a quarter of it is coffee crisps, you can automatically think that that excuse me, those, those coffee crisps are not eaten by the children, they're eaten by the parents. Um, oftentimes the candy was used as a bribe. And, and so small candies of this sort were, would be used as a bribe for parents to encourage their kids to do their chores. Or in the case of uh, Smarties, as a potty training tool. Smarties are also great for math. Um, and so we were looking at other eventing experiences when this candy might be presented. Oftentimes it would be used as a, as a, um, just a snack in a central bowl in um, clubs or meetings where people needed something uh, to keep them busy and um, just a quick bite of a snack. So we've seen, uh, someone mentioned that they had seen these candies in a bowl at a secretary's office where you'd drop in and you'd be standing there and chatting and you'd take a candy bar. Something else that we noted, uh, these candy bars would give people a sense of freedom. Um, one student who was from Ho Chi Minh City said one of their earliest uh, experiences of going to the store was being given some pocket money by their parent and being allowed to walk down the street to the store and they chose to buy a Kit Kat bar. Kit Kat bars being an incredibly international brand. Some of these other brands, Coffee Crisp is specifically Canadian, and Arrow and Smarties are more of a British UK influence, and of course Canada being um, a former British colony and still a constitutional monarchy, uh, we have a lot of shared experience with many of the British influenced uh, candies. We did discuss about the fact that the wrappers were wasteful and polluting, and that was some of the inspiration that we were able to glean um, for some additional ideas of research that we might do if we were part of the Nestle R&D team on this product. Now, I put this photo in here and oftentimes when people are setting up for focus groups, they will do the traditional sensory setup. And depending on the context, there's nothing wrong with doing a traditional sensory setup with the product in labeled cups and and, and, and it's all dependent on the context. If you are, if you are trying to, uh, let's say, for example, blind what the company is or blind what the concept is, totally go for labeled cups, totally go for coded samples. Um, and there's nothing wrong with giving us a water cup and giving a spit cup if you're going to go through a, a wide variety of different food products. In other cases, there's nothing wrong with giving people 
uh, a normal context. Now I realize this is not the Nestle product, or actually this is a Kit Kat product, but uh, this is actually a mixed a mixed uh, group of product here. In other cases, it's totally fine to give the product in the right context. Originally, I had uh, when I when I have done this before, I put some Halloween candy in a bowl in the center of a table, and we all sit around the table, and people grab at it. And after a few minutes, I say, which was the product that you chose first? And it's really interesting to hear about why people chose one product first over another product. Um, and so sometimes uh, changing the context of how that product is presented can change the, the types of, of commentary that you can elicit from the conversation. Now, let's jump into some talk about facilitation. Now, I'm assuming that if you are following along and you've made it this far in this video, that you are likely going to be the facilitator. And so you want to be uh, really uh, practicing and making sure that you've got your script down and you've got your plan in place. You want to be encouraging and give everyone the chance to speak. You want to make sure that if there are people who are being too loud or too quiet, that you're able to um, enc encourage but not, uh, not shut down the person who's really rambling on and on. You want to make them feel like they're still part of the group and uh, encouraged by their opportunity to speak, but at the same time, thanking them for their participation and moving to other people deliberately so that they have an other chance to speak as well. So you want to use uh, appropriate prompts and appropriate uh, ways of, of uh, diplomatically cutting down the conversation when you need to move it to other other. Uh, topics. Something that I also note, um, often when focus group type facilitation is done within teams, so for example, if you're an R&D team and you're doing some internal, um, internal type focus groups, it's very easy as the facilitator to, to either jump into the focus group and start giving your own opinions or just starting to lecture the group. And it's really important as the facilitator to step back and ask the questions and then not inject your own opinions or your own ideas in there. It's tempting and oftentimes team leaders will host focus group type conversations in their teams, but then they'll jump in and inject their own ideas. So you do need to be really aware that you're not imposing your views. And in some cases, if you're doing really critical work, it may be worth the money of hiring an external facilitator or bringing in someone from a completely different department to facilitate uh, if you're working internally because they're not going to have those biases about the team and they're not going to inject themselves into the conversation in ways that can, be, uh, can take you off track from the goals of your uh, focus group. So now let's imagine there's our focus group team at the table and how is your data collected? In some cases, you'll have someone with a flip chart and they will be collecting uh, responses and just picking off high level conversational points. I've run focus groups too where uh, we've, we've given people post-it notes and they'll write their comments and as those comments are, are being collected, we'll put them up on the central board. If you're doing flip chart type uh, data collection, it may be worthwhile having one person as the scribe, just one person writing on the board while you have a second person facilitating so that they can move the conversation along. So there's nothing wrong with flip charts and they're still very, very commonly used. We are seeing lots and lots of organizations using survey tools and even for in-person um, in-person uh, focus groups, sometimes they'll ask people to respond to certain questions online or have a hybrid type format. But we are seeing more and more focus group type activities occurring with 100% online survey tools. Other times when doing, fo when doing focus groups or interviews, you will have people uh, recording and transcribing it. And of course, when doing this, you're using appropriate informed consent and voluntary participation and you, uh, doing it as part of the recruitment phase too, to say, in this focus group, we will be recording uh, your comments and analyzing it using 
um, different software tools. The nice thing about recordings and, and tr uh, transcription is that a lot of the recording tools that are available now will do voice to text and you can quickly get a written summary of everything that was saying everything that was said in that interview or in that focus group. And that's really, really quite brilliant that uh, from a, doing a thematic analysis, which is, is the way that most focus groups are analyzed, you've got the text already transcribed for you. The online transcription tools are becoming quite sophisticated and very accessible to most people. So uh, jumping into the analysis piece, it is what's called the thematic analysis, and there's not a magical statistical method or uh, there's not, an, uh, I want to say, a really um, stepwise uh, process that I can demonstrate for you. What you really have to do is read and read and reread to see what sorts of trends or keywords or uh, themes keep emerging. And when you start to see those themes or patterns emerge, you can start to group those into, into groups and then review what those key themes are. Once you've pulled those themes, then you can start to do additional research and describe those themes. And honestly, when I've done uh, thematic analysis, I often sit there with post-it notes and anytime a keyword pops into mind, I'll throw it into the post-it note and I'll start to see the clusters of those post-it notes gathering together on the table or on the wall where I'm working. And eventually those clusters turn into the themes and patterns that I then do additional analysis on. There are some tools that uh, different, uh, different AI type tools where you can run your scripts through and do word cloud analysis to see are there words that are consistently repeating. Um, but honestly, a lot of it just comes down to reading and having a bit of intuition to say, you know what, I heard those, uh, those key themes repeating and we were able to confirm them with five different participants within our focus groups. We had 20 participants. Um, these are the sorts of um, transitions that are going to occur. And I have had conversations with scientists saying, well, focus groups aren't very scientific. Um, there's plenty, plenty, plenty of information showing the validity of focus groups and case studies for research. Um, one great, uh, great um, analyst who did extensive research into the role of focus groups and semi-structured interviews is Robert K. Yin. And I highly recommend taking a look at his research if you want to find out more about doing thematic analysis. So do try it out. Have fun with it. Again, my, my biggest take home is start Start with people that you know. If you are interested in doing uh, facilitation of qualitative research, next time you have your family together, bring out a product and ask them these. Ask them the types of questions that you would have in your focus group. You're having dinner with your friends. Um, ask them focus group type questions. It's it's not just good for research. It's good for having great conversations as well. Good questions elicit good conversations, and so you know my comment at the end, ask good questions. <laughs> I love it. I look forward to speaking with you again real soon and have fun doing some focus groups. Take care.